Hello, everyone. My name is Maaret Pyhäjärvi, and I'm going to be educating and hopefully maybe even entertaining you a bit for the next 40 minutes on some of my lessons on threat modeling, security-related stuff, but also uh, doing that kind of things, not as sort of a security expert by name, but more of a, from a role of an exploratory tester. I work in a company called F-Secure. I actually joined that company one year ago, so I don't have a very long history with that company from that point of view. But also, I used to work at F-Secure about 10 years ago, back then for three years. So again, when I went back to that company, it felt like I came back home. Half of my friends were still there. They were still doing the same kind of applications and same kind of systems as, as we used to do 10 years ago. And I got to join a corporate side product line for endpoint security. While I previously worked on the consumer side, I just, you know, tipped on the, the business side of things. But I got to join something that I thought I knew quite well. Actually, I do know quite well. And uh, start working on the endpoint security. So Windows machines, keeping those safe. That's, that's what, I, what I do for my, my work. But F-Secure as a company, you might not know about that so much. Let me try to get this forward. But there's this one guy at F-Secure who seems to be appearing in a lot of places. He does crazy amount of keynotes. I think pretty much all of the talks that he does are keynotes. And he appears in TV, especially in Finland, but also around the world. He does TED Talks and all that sort of things. This fellow is called Mikko Hyppönen, and he's kind of the face of F-Secure in many ways. The things that Mikko usually talks about are viruses, uh, ransomware, people making money out of bad things, and it's amazing to look at that guy, you know, when his face lights up when he talks about, you know, all the cool software that bad people have created. And he got to look at that software that the bad people created and figure out how to recognize that and then with a group of other people put that recognition into the products that we're building. This is usually the perspective into security that I kind of also, of course, have because I get to talk to people like Mikko, and I get to listen to people like Mikko. But when I approach security, I look at it very differently. I also get to go to a lot of conferences and do my share of keynotes. I actually just counted. I've done 27 talks this year, 30 last year and 30 before that. And I don't want to even you know, think longer. I started 2001 doing talks. So I've been doing a lot of, of speaking about my experiences, my share of experience as well. But I'm not focusing on the same things as Mikko. What I'm focusing on is the software that the good people create, the non-criminals create. And I'm trying to look at that software from the perspective of how could it provide value, but also how could it not be in the bad people's use so that they do bad things with that. And there's so many ways bad people can do bad things with good software. And that's, I think, quite fascinating. Uh, a lot of times I look for my kind of like identity. What am I? My thing doesn't seem to work. I find myself that the word that I would mostly use of myself is that I'm just a tester. For people who don't know what a tester does, I tend to explain myself as, as I'm a feedback fairy. You know, I'm somebody who comes to place and gives you feedback, everyone pretty much around me. Uh, I give them feedback, uh, hopefully on time, hopefully with a smile on my face instead of like in a nagging tone. And based on that feedback or the gift of feedback that I bring, somebody can do some, something differently. But I'm also a lot more because I think actually none of us is just anything these days. I realized a couple of years ago that I've actually been programming in 14 different languages. So that's why I call myself a polyglot programmer. And I just before this session counted that the software that I'm right now creating needs me to work on five languages on a weekly basis. So I read code. I write code, but most of my effort goes into the wonderful puzzle of how does the code end up failing and how does it actually give chances to the bad people to do things that we didn't intend to do. Another way of kind of looking at my identity, I really like this quote, so I took the picture from Andrea Goulet's presentation, 
is that there are some people who think that their dream jobs, even as programmers, is to be menders instead of makers. So looking at other people's code, cleaning it up, and making it such that when new people join the company, you don't have to count the WTFs per minute, but you actually have a constructive discussion and fun with your team on working on that code. And all of these are things that I feel kind of caring for the code, caring for its quality, caring for security, are things that fit into my so-called just a tester identity. So I wanted to talk today about particular experiences that I've had uh, with my team figuring out how do we build software that actually doesn't open up all the holes for the bad people to do bad things. So in the core of this whole thing is my team. I work in a very small team. I would call it very much an agile team. And if you had a chance of listening to Joshua Kerievsky's talk on modern agile, all those ideas that he talks about, they very much are the lifeline of, of my team. We release into production as soon as something is ready. We've worked to get faster at this, even though we deliver Windows endpoint installable software. So we have ways of you know, changing it without the users noticing it. And that also, of course, opens all kinds of, of other avenues. My team uh, gets new features asked on a regular basis. They are usually very small, and when from the small streams, we build bigger, bigger uh, rivers. And uh, on all of this kind of like fast-paced development, it's sometimes it's kind of hard to figure out where does the security work actually belong? Well, it belongs in the hearts of everyone in the team, of course. So one of the things I know about my team really well is that when you mention security, everyone jumps. So when there is anything related to we are concerned about security, that's when you get everyone's attention. So sometimes you might even say that, even if you're not sure about the security problem, just to get the, the attention. The other parts on security is that uh, in a fast-paced environment, my team really works a lot with you know, the code repository that we have. It just happens to be Stash. A lot of people in the hallways probably would talk about Git, but it just uh, is this particular brand this time. And the pull requests are the lifeline of, of the way we work. I'd say that the biggest chunk of security work that we actually do happens around people reading the code and recognizing bad patterns in code. And it's fascinating to learn on a daily basis what kind of things people notice when they read just a couple of lines of code and changes, how there's uh, potential vulnerabilities introduced, and how quickly they can be fixed at that point of, of things. But there's also another thing that we do, which is what we want to focus on today, which is that sometimes through the product backlog work, we get to do thing called threat modeling, security threat modeling, which basically means that we get people together and talk about uh, whatever design implementation we have at this point and try to identify, like try to give space for the idea that uh, there might be some things that are bad, bad to happen. And as the last piece in the process, there's the CVE bits. So if there is a reported publicly available vulnerability, there's nothing higher priority to a team like this in a company like mine right now. And it might not be the same in, in every, every different place. At least it hasn't been in non-security companies that I have worked with. But it uh, might be changing in the future. So that's kind of the, the high level into, into what kind of team I work with. And from there, I want to uh, dig in a little deeper, first into exploratory testing, then into security threat modeling, and then into combining those two. So get, let's uh, look at uh, exploratory testing at first. So a year ago, when I joined F-Secure, one of the first things that I saw is, is that we had a new slogan. This slogan didn't exist 10 years ago. We see things that other people don't. I would completely say that this is the way testers look at the world. But apparently, it's also the way security companies look at the world. We see things that other people don't see 
because we spend time and effort in seeing the things and paying attention to those things. So my credentials as an exploratory tester, I always like to refer to programmers. This is from a colleague of mine, a programmer, who uh, gave a statement in a podcast about work that I did on his project. He said that, well, I was like, you know, she's like, uh, I want to exploratory test your project. And he's like, yeah, sure, it's all test driven and I'm very proud of the code, so no problem. Go ahead, you won't find anything. It was a bit of like a competition in a way. And in about an hour and a half, she destroyed it, finding problems all over the place. That's kind of the type of thing that an expert or tester would do. So learning rapidly to, to provide feedback. None of this feedback in an hour and a half was related to security, but it could have been. Most of this was about getting uh, a new API into use, uh, using that application with data that was surprising, and figuring out that, that things were not quite as, as they seem. So a lot of the work exploratory testers do, whether it's exploratory testers who are just you know, on the side exploratory testing, or people who are full-time exploratory testing, what they do is they go after illusions. So if you think of testers, you often think of testers as people who break the code, but that's not what testers do. They break illusions about the code. And there's all sorts of illusions. Today, I'm not trying to talk about all those illusions, but I'm going to focus on this one particular type of illusion. The illusion that people believe that there are not bad people doing bad things with their software, if it's possible. So that's a big, big illusion to, to break. In order to do this work, I tend to do is that I look at applications and the products that I look at, they're kind of like my you know, external imagination. Sometimes I look at an application, I have the API description in front of me, this is what we do to uh, call uh, a backend service so that it would give us a new customer ID and, and then we could do more things afterwards. And it just you know, whispers to me saying, you need to look a little deeper. Let's see what's in the, if you do like, if you do a request where, where you get a denied answer, what else does it give you? And it whispers all these kinds of things on like, oh, you can see these fields here. They get filled with various kinds of data. What if that data wasn't meant to be there? Or if you look at an uh, user interface, it might be whispering me as a tester looking at it, I mean, you want to click here. You absolutely want to click here. Maybe you want to click here twice. And sometimes, you know, it's hard to explain why it whispers these kinds of things. But I think that it's practice and it's years of, of learning to listen to that application. And one of the things that I really enjoy about doing exploratory testing in particular is this idea that people who are excited about exploratory testing, when put together in the same teams with programmers, like right now I am in the team of, of six great personalities, all very different, I turn into the external imagination for my programmers. They look at me and say, Oop, you'd want me to click here, you'd want me to create this kind of a test case, You'd want us to spend time on analyzing security vulnerabilities. Like, I don't even have to remind them anymore that, you know, there's certain things that we are used to doing. They look at me and they somehow read my face saying, okay, yeah, sure, we need to do that just before we go, go out. So a lot of times using the product as our external imagination, that's the core skill that we need to, to kind of build for. So... All of these kind of skills and ways of learning around applications and getting the applications to speak to us. The same skills are very much applicable when we're trying to then, you know, take this deep look into the world of security. And sometimes listening to people who are full-time security experts, it gives, it gives you this idea that maybe you don't know enough. But you need to remember that the full-time security expert might not be on your project. And then whatever skills you have available today on security, 
whatever effort you're willing to put towards that, that perspective, that's already more than the team would have at their hands otherwise. And again, from the exploratory point of view, whenever you do something, you learn, and the more you do and the more you learn, the more chances there is to learn more. So again, it just builds and builds on, on itself. So threat modeling is this idea of let's get our group together and give time for a discussion around security vulnerabilities. Let's try identifying those. And in order you know, to be successful with that, you would usually want to at least believe, like testers usually are taught to believe that you know, there might be still problems. If you believe there are no problems, it will be harder to, to spot them. So the mindset of going in is, is quite relevant. In my company, we have a process of how these threat modeling things are supposed to go. And it has been trying this, this process. It's been trying to kind of catch up with all the ideas of agile development and continuous delivery. But uh, what the process nowadays says is that there's somebody who is an owner of priorities. And they are supposed to order uh, threat modeling via an item on the product backlog. Well, for about two weeks now, my team has worked on an idea called no product owner and no product backlog. So I'm not sure how this works on my team right now. But it seems to be that, you know, remembering that this is a relevant thing to do without having an external mechanism is enough for us. But if you need an external mechanism, this might be, might be the kind of thing that you would use. So after someone orders it, meaning someone makes space in our calendars to be present at the same time, what we do is, is that we collect the people, smart brains, different brains, different perspectives, but all focused on identifying things around security for that given time frame. We put those people together, usually in one room, usually not even in the team room, even though we have a whiteboard there, there, but in some other room so that we feel that we're taking a step back from the everyday running things and making things go live and into production and just draw on a whiteboard. So the threat modeling for us, it's a whiteboard exercise where we are trying to figure out where the vulnerabilities in the system might be to identify work that we did not know that needs to happen. So it's very much akin or same kind of work as testing. A lot of times we find unknown unknowns, things that we need to then fix, react on, that we didn't know before. But this usually happens more uh, closer to the design than having the whole implementation, but with Agile, these get to be very intertwined in many ways, adding a feature by feature into, into the system. So typically what we do is we go on a whiteboard and we draw pictures. Most of the teams that I work with, uh, or most of the uh, uh, features that I work with in the last year and also before, what we start drawing first is a data flow diagram, like this, this piece of information here, and it goes here, and, and it's moving between these components, and we, you know, boxes and arrows and, and borders, and trying to figure out what kind of concepts do we have in our system to make data move, and then talk around that. Uh, what kind of threats there might be? Could somebody be eavesdropping somewhere in middle? Is there a possibility for that? Could somebody be tampering with the data and, and changing it in some way? Could someone we be blocking us uh, the access to that data and all, all that sort of thing? So most common type of a drawing that we do is just try to show in a picture how the data flows. But there are, and there at least has been in my year at, at FSecure now, there has been also cases where we don't find anything interesting in the data flow. Because, you know, it's still the same product, it's still the same, you know, general framework. But the feature that we just added, the way information flows within that, the way the, the commands can happen in a particular order, there might be ways of doing bad things with that. And one specific example that I uh, did work with in detail is around introducing rules into a firewall and finding all kinds of fancy ways of, of making sure that the rules that I want to be in place 
will not be in place if anyone has access to that that computer. So in that kind of scenario, it might be that you know drawing a, a sequence chart of what kind of things happen in the program, what kind of messages go on, and in which order might be more more relevant. So again. I've done quite a few of these sessions on quite a few of different features in the last year. And I find that as much as I read all the books on this topic or look at the general examples on this topic, what it really is, is an exercise of people speaking around a picture. So it's not about how fancy the picture is, but it's about how daring you are in saying that you, you might be concerned about this line here. What happens if this line here is not available or if somebody's eavesdropping there? So usually around the pictures, we have a checklist then to kind of remember to have relevant discussions. And there's usually two checklists that are kind of easy to start using. The first one is Stride. This is a Microsoft's model. Uh, the idea of kind of thinking from various perspectives when you look at things that might go wrong. Spoofing, meaning that somebody, you know, could go and, and, and just, you know, pretend uh, to be someone else, uh, pretend to be uh, in a place that they're not supposed to be. Tampering, changing things in ways that are unintended. Repudiation, meaning that they could say that they didn't do something and you have no proof if they did or not. Uh, information disclosure, kind of like leaking information that you weren't supposed to be. Uh, denial of service, meaning that there might be ways of you not getting access to your information, even though you were supposed to, because someone else has a way of blocking that with something negative. Or elevation of privilege. I'm supposed to be only doing things according to my user level rights, but to do something I need to give more rights, does that open new avenues? into doing more things with those rights, or how do we actually bring people back to the right level of, of privileges. So these type of discussions around the models is, is what uh, security threat modeling is, is really about. The other checklist that I wanted to kind of share with you is, is, I think this is getting a lot more attention right now because of the changing law in the European Union around how we treat privacy. It's a big topic that you know, almost everyone actually should be talking about. This idea that uh, actually next year, I think springtime, we're going to have to start thinking about how do we actually let go of data that we have collected on, on, on people. So uh, the ideas of, of which laws apply, uh, how long do we keep data, how do you get get uh, rid of it, how do you let people review the data, uh, which is about them, and how do you keep it as minimal as possible. So we have to have discussions around those as well. So out of all this threat modeling work, what usually happens is that there's more work coming out. So that's kind of why we keep talking about this idea of a product backlog having something that initiates a threat modeling session, and then there's more work coming to the product backlog out of a, a threat modeling session. So a good threat modeling session would typically fit into one hour so that people can you know, be awake and, and active and, and still pay attention. If you have to spend half a day or a full day on trying to analyze something, it's getting a bit heavy. Heavy, so uh, you'd rather you know look at smaller pieces at a time and then take a, a break. But out of all of those sessions, in order to keep them in a concise time frame, what you usually need to do is not to do all the work that is suggested to be done in that session, but just you know collect tasks. Some of the typical tasks that I, I see coming out of threat modeling is like of course when, when you have testers in threat modeling, the first thing that comes out is maybe we should test this. Maybe we should, you know, run some kind of like a scan of, of open ports on the computer if there's any new ones. We claim we are not opening new servers here, but is that really true? There might be uh, uh, fuzzing done on, on interfaces. And a lot of times I find that a lot of my tester colleagues get excited about the idea of learning pen testing, penetration testing. Let's break into the system. Let's put that now on our task list. But 
in my experience, uh, within the features that I've had to work with, in nine out of 10 cases, penetration testing isn't the thing that we actually would find best value out of. But it's usually more on the side of, let's review the unit tests, let's make sure that the uh, 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 configuration of the server is, is HTTPS instead of HTTP, and all that sort of things, like smaller actions than introducing a whole new type of, of, of testing. A lot of times, I think my pet peeve is introducing logging and introducing claims around logging. So a lot of times kind of, you know, around the non-repudiation, the idea of, of not being able to do things that you can then claim you didn't do. Testers know from experience that there's a lot of things where this won't leave a mark. And having that discussion in a threat modeling session can give you then the action point of, of you know, just looking at those as a testing thing a bit more in, in detail. There might be architecture changes, even end-user documentation that might help here. But the thing that I find usually to be the most relevant for me as an exploratory tester coming out of those sessions, all of this, this is nice, but the ideas of things people claim and making a list of those, that's the most powerful thing that I usually take out that I notice that most others in my sessions have not been taken out. So there might be a claim that uh, uh, in a fire, case of a firewall, that uh, we have implemented things so that uh, deny rules get introduced always uh, before allow rules. And I mark that usually down as a claim someone made in an Agile project where there is no detailed documentation. These are great places to actually collect claims about things people believe. Or things like, uh, for example, there's the claim of we will be using, or we are using HTTPS, you don't have to worry about someone eavesdropping here. And then when you go back to your desk with those claims, and you start systematically exploring around those claims, you might learn that HTTPS is actually not on. And it's interesting then when someone tells you that, oh yeah, we were planning to turn it on. It was nowhere in our task lists, but we surely would have remembered it in the next two weeks, even without someone reminding about that. So the long list of claims around whatever we were drawing on the, on the whiteboard, it's actually really, really powerful. So I wanted to kind of move from here to talk about combining these two ideas the threat modeling and the, the exploratory testing. So when we draw on a whiteboard, this is a very fuzzy picture. Well, would be if I get to that. It's a very fuzzy picture, but uh, they look, even on the whiteboard, the drawings that we do, they look a lot messier than the ones that, that I had on, on my first examples. Even I, having been in this session, have a hard time explaining exactly what this picture means. And I know for a fact that we don't have documentation on this level somewhere in a nice drawing. And I know that there's about 25 things that since this picture was drawn have already changed because of adding new features into, into the system. But when drawing this picture, the first one on the left, that was a data flow diagram. We didn't find pretty much anything analyzing that. So we draw the one on the right, which is more of a sequence diagram, where we then found a lot of interesting stuff, kind of the big uh, uh, fuzzy but uh, round uh, area there. There's something interesting going on there. So having those discussions and getting that information, sharing that from a developer to developer, but also from a developer to tester, that level of information doesn't necessarily flow unless you have a reason to get together and talk about this stuff. So the security threat modeling gives you ideas of what were we supposed to build so that it is secure and then you can go after, after those. But the other thing that kind of comes out of that is the encouragement to pay attention to security. This 
a little picture of code here is not from our production code. It's actually a picture that I took from an exercise that my developers used for uh, assessing uh, developers that were joining our team. And I found it absolutely fascinating how a small piece of code would speak volumes to people who we wanted to hire. This one has a uh, a bit of pointer uh, uh, handling and, and the usual C++ uh, problematics. And, you know, just the usual problems of, of it's easy to, to get it to crash so that you can then have free access to write whatever you want into the stack. Stack, which is one of the very classic ways of, of, uh, of making security break. But you can't see that level of stuff on the threat modeling sessions, but the threat modeling sessions might give you the idea of you're just as welcome looking at the code and, you know, working with others on figuring out what are the patterns in code that would, would help you recognize that things are, are going wrong. And in a company like the one that I work with, where there's this idea of an open, internal open source community. Anyone can make check-ins. Uh, they just end up being code reviewed by someone else, and it could be anyone in the company. Well, ten, it tends to be so that somebody who knows the code base volunteers more easily than somebody who, who doesn't. But uh, the idea of, of then getting feedback on what you're trying to do in real time almost, that's actually kind of a, a neat thing, neat thing to, to happen. And anyone with an exploratory testing mindset is just as welcome into the code reviews as any of the other work. So a lot of this experience really boils down to this idea that I talked about that uh, exploratory testers or testers in general, they tend to be in the business of breaking illusions. And there's many kinds of illusions that we break. And the main type of illusion around security is that the product only does the things it's supposed to do. Security is actually a functional uh, characteristic of the, the application, that it allows functionalities or features that bad people can do to do bad things. So breaking illusions around this, this kind of things is, is a core uh, thing to, to learn to do. I also took another little piece of advice from our uh, general processes in the company, which is to say, who should be doing threat modeling and, and uh, related things. And the piece of advice says that, you know, you could do this uh, yourself, provided that you are in a brilliant team that has great dynamics so that they actually hear each other. I'm so happy that I had that with my team especially when you use the keyword security, you actually do get heard. Uh, are free from cognitive biases. I don't know anyone who is this. But if we have a very varied group of people working around the concept of security and potential vulnerabilities, we might be able to see different ways of doing bad things. And I find that the things that I bring in my team, the concerns that nobody else right now voices, are around abuse, especially online abuse. Using the cool technologies that we have into bullying someone in the uh, world of internet. It might just be that it's something that I've you know, ended up looking at personally myself, but the way of kind of getting uh, a little bit rid of these cognitive biases is to have a diverse group of people working on, on the problems. And the last bit, having an up-to-date knowledge of common attack vectors. For spending a year in reading CVEs with enthusiastic uh, 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 approach, I can say that even the security experts don't have enough time to read all of that stuff. They can't know all of it. We need to pay attention to the examples of holes, security holes, that others have that seem relevant in the types of applications we are creating, make choices of what is the most important information that we want to provide in our teams, and then prioritize what kind of information we're, we're following. So they are great examples of what kind of things might go wrong, 
And I really encourage using those as a, as a learning tool. But the main thing that putting these two things together, I find is, is that uh, it really takes just patience. So you need to kind of give chances for yourself to find the problems that could be there or are there as of now. And you usually find them better when you give yourself a little more time instead of just you know, showing up in the one hour session and assuming that's all the thinking around security that you're gonna be doing. So when you stick with the problems and you follow up on the claims around what kind of security measures we have, that already keep us safe. You do a lot better work around uh, the, the security related uh, implementations. So I like these ideas of serendipity and perseverance. So the first of all, I kind of use these quotes on the serendipity, being lucky by accident. Somehow it feels like, you know, the more I practice, the luckier I get. 25 years in testing, I'm really lucky with all kinds of problems nowadays. But uh, there might be more than, than luck there. And the other part on the perseverance, I really believe in this, this quote from Albert Einstein that, you know, it's not about how smart you are, but it's just that you stay with the problems longer. And I think that's key in testing, it's key in development, it's key in pretty much all the things we do that are a little complicated. So as the last piece that I wanted to share on this, this talk is, is an article that I read in the end of the, uh, well, a couple of weeks ago, end of last month, a week and a half ago about. Uh, the article uh, was very uh, tempting to me in the sense that it mentions money in the, in the title. Somebody who actually describes very much similar things than what I do on my day-to-day -day basis, talks about this idea of spending a few days on Google's application, participating in uh, bug bounty programs that very many companies nowadays have, taking a very lucrative application that, you know, I, for example, should know by heart as well, just, you know, envious of this guy that I didn't realize this myself, a bug tracker that they have, and then showing that it leaks information like crazy. And he makes quite a nice, you know, monthly salary out of that. So when we are actually using exploratory testing as a way of kind of, you know, digging in and learning more about the real practical implications of security, maybe, you know, we can take a side job. We don't have to quit our current jobs. Maybe I would be, you know, paid better uh, as someone who just, you know, occasionally goes and hunts the same kinds of bugs we missed in our own software in someone else's. So I think that's a kind of a cool thing to do. And as the very final kind of like a takeaway, last year when I joined F-Secure, I joined also this course. It's an multi, it's a MOOC, so it's multiple, no, it's massive online course system thing. So you could have like, I think they had like 10,000 people there last year. And I was just, you know, one person who was filling in all the kind of exercises there. But I found that course, actually, it's a free course. And it was really fascinating in the sense that it gave these very simple kind of like code scriptlets and tools of how do you go through various kinds of, of security threats. And how do you actually make that all that information that we have about it might be wrong in this way, how do you turn that into action against uh, uh, some kind of an API or an application? Application that you're supposed to be testing with. So I suggest that you would maybe look at that and, and uh, it's a great way of, of kind of like enhancing some of your skills, skills around uh, security. It definitely has been a valuable thing for me and out of all of the things that I do uh, around software, I find that uh, the more years I spend on software, the more different kinds of skills I can pick up. And it's no longer about what I can do. It's about what I can make my team do by knowing that a thing exists. So you might want to also consider that, that not everything is just things you, you do yourself. So that's what I wanted to share. Today, I wanted to leave a few minutes for, for questions and, and discussions. Anyone would be welcome on, on, on that side. Yeah. Hmm? 
Oh, yeah, I know, two minutes as per my schedule. Okay? So the question here is that you hear a lot about scanners that kind of go through the, the common security vulnerabilities, like not having your software up to date. But a lot of the things that you in your company would be interested in, in knowing about is the vulnerabilities in your business processes, whatever you have implemented. So yeah, I know that uh, there we people have implemented stuff around that. Like for example, they've extended Selenium with a tool called Mitten that they've created. So uh, I see that in some of our projects, but that tends to be certain people who run that tool still, so it's not in widespread use as, as such. But this is definitely a topic that people kind of try to address on, on what could be the ways of, of running tools on top of whatever existing functional testing we have. And, and that's a very fascinating thing around the, the security DevOps type of things. There's a lot of work done on that right now. All right. but. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, I guess we're out of time, and I would be happy to have discussions with anyone while I'm here. I'm going to be here all today and, and all tomorrow, so I hope that somebody makes me happy and comes to talk to me. Thanks.